Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 236 for Monday, December 9th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show that's by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Band Zoogle, where coupon code, promo code, Gig Gab will get you 15% off your first year. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about that shortly. But for now, back here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Back here in San Jose, California, Paul Kent. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, uh, I was only away for a little bit. I was away this weekend. We, uh, we had a hockey tournament down in Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off the coast of Massachusetts, which is it really it's I mean, it's yeah, it's off the coast of Massachusetts. And uh, it's interesting. You have to take a ferry to get there. There's no causeway or anything. So it, how long is the ferry? Um, about 40 minutes or so. It's not terrible. It's a it's a pretty manageable ferry. Uh, it's pretty easy. You just drive. You can drive your car on or not. Um, we, we took our car with us this year just cause it's makes life a little easier to, uh, to be able to get around to the hockey rink and, and it's cold, you know, this time of year, most, most people visit Martha's Vineyard in the summer. Uh, it is most definitely a tourist destination in the summer, but right. they create different things where like this with the hockey tournament where, you know, I think the, the most hockey tournaments you have to pay to, to be a part of, you know, cause ice time and all that. I think with these, the hotels sort of kick back and, and, uh, <laughs> And, you know, help cover some of those costs because it was other than that, it was free. Yep. But, yeah, but it's fine. Like, you know, it's how it works. But um, the hotel we stayed at uh, added a bar uh, in the last year, which is good. And they had live music on both Friday and Saturday night, which we had uh. n- no idea about. Right. So we walked in to have dinner on Friday night before heading off to the game, which was a late game that night. And it was like, oh, there's a band here. Cool. Great. And it was just, you know, it was a little th- three piece band. The band on Friday night uh, was a, a good lineup. It was a guitar player, a drummer and a keyboard player, no bass player. The keyboard player was handling the bass lines uh, with his left hand and, and playing. And the sound was full. It was great. And, you know, it's a it's a small room. The band is like right on top of people. So you have to manage your volume and all that, which which the band on Friday and on Saturday both both did. And these guys on Friday were great. Their harmonies were killer. Uh, they were entertaining both when they were performing, but also like between songs. You know, we talk a lot here about always be performing, right? And this band did it. They how old were the guys? Um, probably mid forties, fifties kind of thing. I mean, it was you know it was that kind of a vibe. Like I would say my age ish. Weekend warrior type guys. Or you Definitely. Think they're, they're- no, right. definitely weekend warriors, but they, you know, they knew each other. They had met before the gig, <laughs> like they had rehearsed their songs. They were pulling stuff off the cuff at times, but, it, but that was only in terms of like the set list. I don't think they were just like pulling songs out of thin air. Uh, they, they sounded good. They were good at playing together in between songs. Their banter was, was engaging, you know, even, even mid song, if they would look at each other and laugh or whatever, like they were definitely performing a hundred percent of the time. And, and, you know, when they were singing, they were looking at the audience and all of that. And they were fantastic. We really, really liked them. We were sad that we got back from the game that uh, their sets had ended and it was just music on in the bar. Um, But you know, that's how it goes. Right. And then Friday, uh, then that was Friday night. So then Saturday night, we wound up in the bar again because the games ended early enough and we went to have dinner or whatever. And and so now we're in the bar, different band. And this was a guitar, bass and drums. And it was awful. <laughs> uh, you know, like each person was moderately talented. It, it wasn't that, that anybody was bad. It was just that this band, it was clear that it was a pickup band. They were joking about how they had given this drummer uh, a list of songs and now they were throwing different songs at her right out of the gate, at least on whatever set we were seeing. And, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, we're asking her to play different songs that she's never played before. And it was obvious that that like even a song like Come Together 
uh, from the Beatles was sort of a mess. Uh, she, she just didn't know it, which I mean, I, it but, could be but a cardinal sin of kind of airing your airing your lack of preparation yes, to the audience. That's right. That's the cardinal sin is don't tell us like we're going to if it's that obvious, we're going to figure it out, you know, but T- telling us doesn't give you a pass. It doesn't right. say, oh, oh, I get it. Now I know why that they're not prepared. Right. You know, the, the, the only time I would think that you'd want to tell people that is if like maybe, you know, you play a song and and the person who's filling in or whatever it is, I, it, it was not obvious whether this was a lineup that plays all the time or if it was it was a pickup lineup or something. But certainly the song list was not solidified between the three of them. And uh, and, you know, if if you have somebody filling in, let's say you got a guitar player filling in or whatever, and they just, you know, shred a solo during a tune or whatever, you could say, oh, you know, that's that's Timmy. And and uh, that's the first time he's played that song with us. That's pretty good. You know, like you might be able to get away with it then maybe, but. To to just make a joke about it, and they were playing. Yeah, it was just. I mean, it when they were playing, they were looking at each other, but not in an entertaining way. The the it was the guitar player who sang all of the songs. He was the only one who had a microphone. Although the bass player should have had one because anytime I could hear the bass player just singing harmonies into the air, he sounded great. So that that could have been fixed, but. He, you know, he never looked at the crowd. He was always either looking down at his guitar or staring back at the drummer, probably to make sure that, you know, things stayed in sync because of how unrehearsed they were. So it was just it was night and day. And Lisa and I were like, all right, cool. Yep. Time to go back to the room, watch a movie. All Mm. good. You know, it was just bad. Uh you know, and it, it was it was really interesting because the, the first night, I mean, it was like, oh, great. There's a good band here. You know, and I didn't think much of it until it was immediately contrasted. The well, next you would night. assume that the that the booking person at the venue has some standards or you know knows what he's doing. Right. Well, yeah. And it might be the kind of thing, though, like I get the feeling and I did not ask. So I'm I'm just projecting here. But, you know, I've seen enough of this where I'm probably not too far off the mark that the guitar player w- was the one that booked the gig and, and said, I'll bring a band in. I'll bring my band. And I don't even know what it was called. Like they didn't even have a, a sign up or a name or anything, but let's say it was the Tim Jones band. Right. And Tim Jones is the guitar player and Tim Jones just finds whomever Tim Jones can find on a random Saturday night to come and play as the Tim Jones band. And it, that it just didn't work. That said, I'm not all that. And of course, I'm making this name up. It was not the Tim Jones band. So if you're Tim Jones out there and you play on Martha's <laughs> Vineyard, either, calm down. Yeah, calm down. <laughs> either either I really got lucky and, and named it exactly right, or I'm not talking about you. So uh, the, um, it, but I, my, I would not, I'm not convinced that the Tim Jones band in any configuration would ever be all that good. Tim Jones seemed to be. Uh, seemed to be able to crack himself up at any moment by doing whatever it was that Tim Jones was doing. And it was not good. So mm. I apologize. My apologies to all the Tim Joneses out there. I stuck with the, with the reference and it just, I don't know. I think I, I, think I hung on for too long. Yeah. <laughs> I should have, you know, the, I should have this abandoned. Is that thing about, this is that thing about subs. I will say from my experience, subs are tough. Always. I've it, at any one position in our band one out of 10 people who say that they can sub are really good enough to sub right so right you know that i think the interesting thing is you can have someone who's a who's a fairly solid musician who'll say hey if you ever need a sub sure and there's two assumptions going on there and, and do the assumptions match so one well, is, but in this I, in this I, case, it, it, I don't I I don't put the the blame on on the drummer in this case or the bass player. Like I I don't know if this was truly just a pickup band or if there if this was a person subbing for someone else. That was not clear. I put the blame though on the leader on Tim uh, Jones on Tim Jones. Yeah, because Tim Jones clearly because he told us his responsibility. Well, he gave a list to these people, and then they were playing things that went you know immediately off the list. It's like, that's weird. Well, well yeah. dude, like you make it sound good for a while first, then maybe have some fun. Like we're going to try something that, that, you know, uh, Nancy hasn't played before. Bear with us on this. This might be fun. Or we got a request or whatever, you know, whatever. Like yeah. that's fine, but you gotta, you gotta sell it first and then use that, that, you know, that 
A little um, momentum, a little bit yeah. of, uh, you know, goodwill that you've earned. Goodwill. No, I that's totally the right get word. it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I, I, I just kind of stand by what I was sharing is that that the whole proposition of subs is rife with with terror to me. So I've had yep. horn subs. And again, my my horn section uh, reads. They have uh, iPads and they read. And the number of um, horn subs who've said that they could handle our book who just can't, they, they're good readers, but not great readers. And they don't think fast on their feet. And they, you know, they, they're just, they, I'm not asking for spectacular. I'm asking for solid. And I've encountered people who have fallen below the line of solid. And then with rhythm section players, you know, even if I don't mind them and we don't have very many rhythm section players at least subs, but right. that, that implied, if you ask me to sub, there's a whole range of, I, I have a friend who I've just started playing with who's a guitar player who is an awesome sub. He preps, he walks in, great ears, he's a pro. Sure. I've had subs who are like, well, what did you expect? I mean, you want me to learn a whole show, you know, in, in a week? You know, you asking me to sub means you understand, as a drummer, I'm going to lay it down and you're going to play it over and everybody's going to go for the lowest common denominator. You know, that's that's one specter. And then there's, guys who get carried away and you know once they think it's going well they you know start branching out and and going in their own direction i i just find true subs and we've had the great discussions on this show about true pros true subs are are rare true people who are qualified to sub sure are rare and um uh you know what it does to your brand so is it worth keeping a gig if you're gonna be not as entertaining. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Well, that, it, that's the thing gig? is regardless of the reason, like th whether these were subs or, or a pickup band, which I, I mean, it, there's a there's a blurred line there. Right. But um, it was this was not all that good. And it was like, yeah, yeah. man, like like you shouldn't have done this. If, if you're going to have a sub you or, or a pickup band, you need to a know the capabilities of the people that are going to be on stage with you and B prepare yourself and everyone to be an entertaining thing like that. It, and I, I feel like that just gets lost so easily in, cause I've been in this scenario where either I'm a sub or a, it's a pickup band and you know, you're playing with people you don't know. And I've been with it on both sides where it works out great because Someone takes the reins and has a vision of how they believe success is going to happen. Right. And mm. they pave this path and it works out and it's fine. And it, it actually some of those are my uh, my favorite gigs. Right. Because you'd go in a little bit apprehensive. You don't quite know what's going to happen. You've got to have big ears. You've got to really pay attention. And it can it can be magical. And then the flip side of it is if no one takes the reins or if the wrong person takes the reins, I suppose, uh, you wind up with a scenario where there's no direction and it's just like, ah, you know, we'll figure it out on the fly. It's going to be fine. And what happens is exactly what I saw the other night where the band isn't is so worried about in and maybe not even aware of it, but they're so focused on being engaged with each other that they never engage the crowd. And that mm. was the that was the biggest thing here. It's like, you know, you're all decent at your instruments. If you just played songs and were confident that everybody was on board and you could focus outward at least 50 percent of the time, that would change everything. And, and if you had a set list where you could just know or whatever it takes for that lineup to be successful, do it. And then and then, you know, like you said, when you've got that goodwill earned, maybe now you can you can play with it a little bit later in the night. But you've got to get that earned. And if the crowd is one that's rotating all night long, then the goodwill that you earned in the first set, you don't like it doesn't exist in the third set until you right. earn it there. So it's just being aware of that. And then last night I went and saw Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. And I want to talk about that from exactly this same, same standpoint. But first, I want to tell everybody about our sponsor, which is Banzoogle. No matter what you're doing with your band, you want a place where people can come and learn about your band, get in touch with you, that is yours. 
And that's what Banzoogle gives you is a website, but it's not just a website. It's a whole platform, an engine that is built by musicians for musicians and makes it easy to build that beautiful website for you and your music and also host it. Right. It's all in one there. And they power the websites for tens of thousands of musicians and bands around the world from Grammy winners to weekend warriors to even the house rockers. Right? Yeah. And they make it easy because you don't have to know HTML and how to manage a server or any of that. You pick from their customizable templates, right? That you start with one of their templates and then you start putting your own stuff in and truly easily make it your own. And on top of that, they've got tools to sell your music and all your merch and it's commission free mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send your newsletters. Of course, all the social media integrations so that you can have these homes elsewhere that are all linked back to your main home that you control. And of course, live support from their musician friendly team seven days a week. They've got they've got a crowdfunding feature that lets you crowdfund your next project commission free and also commission free fan subscription feature because that way your fans can pay a monthly fee in exchange for like exclusive rewards or access to music that you're working on or whatever. And it gives you that recurring revenue that you're not going to get. No club is going to give you recurring revenue unless you keep showing up there. So gig gab listeners, you can get bandzoogle.com. Go there and try it for free for 30 days. And then when you're ready to buy, Use the promo code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. And we've got a link that'll take care of all that in the show notes at GIGGABpodcast.com. But if you don't want to go there, it's fine. Go to Banzoogle.com. Make sure to use promo code GIGGAB to get that 15% off. And our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring. They, the they really are great. I'll just add one last thing, yeah, Dave. You know, they um, are constantly adding updated themes so you can refresh oh. your website. They just came out with a cool new one called Ghost. They have dozens of themes that really, with a couple of clicks, you can really refresh the look and keep your, uh, keep your listeners, keep your fans coming back to see what's new all, all the time. It's just they just think it through so well. And it really is as if, you know, someone in your band was a web expert and uh, and, uh, you know, you knew you could rely on them to make you look good. That's what the experience of working with Banzoogle is like. Except it's even better because when you're on stage, there's still somebody monitoring the server. They're working. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so Bella. Bela Fleck. Yeah. So I have seen Bela Fleck before and uh, I've seen actually I've seen Bela Fleck in, in a variety of different uh, configurations, but I've seen Bela Fleck in the Fleck tones several times. I think the first time was it was either 93 or 94. I, uh, I might I thought it was 93, but I might have that wrong by one year. And they they the first time I saw them, I, I went in knowing that these four guys on stage are, you know, like mutants on their instruments. Right. And and their music is is cerebral. They're always doing interesting things with their music. But of course, I went into that first show back in the 90s wondering, you know, what it was going to be like to see this guy, Victor Wooten on stage, the bass player that that re- he really was the one that that, you know, sort of burst into the spotlight when that band, uh, when their first album came out with that tune, Sinister Minister, and he had that bass solo that was like, oh, so this is what it would have been like if Jocko had lived. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. and, uh, but what really, well, it, Victor's fantastic. He's an entertaining guy. And of course he's a monster on the bass. Uh, Howard Levy, their keyboard player and harmonica player was the biggest surprise of, of the night 30 years ago or whatever it was when I first saw him. Uh, he he has the ability to play like multiple melodies on the same harmonica in and even bending like he only plays blues harps as i understand it but he'll play classical pieces on these things or or you know chromatic melodies on them by bending notes to get the ones in the middle but he'll be doing it with both sides of his mouth simultaneously playing a bass line and doing this other so it's really he's he's a monster and then of course he can also play the piano while he's doing it which is, you know, why not? Right. But all of these guys, the drummer um, actually last night was the first time I saw him play some real drums. He, he, um, his claim to fame, he called it's, it's Victor Wooten's brother, Roy, but uh, he calls himself future man. And he plays this. Uh, it's a syntax, which is a MIDI guitar that he modified with pads and stuff uh, so that he turned it into what he calls the drum guitar. 
and then he plays you know tr- midi triggered drums uh, with it but it, they're they're a fantastic band to see when uh when future man is is playing his his drum guitar he, they're all just standing up unless unless howard's sitting at the piano but if he's up playing harmonica he's standing and they're interesting they're they're sort of geeky guys they um, like I said, their music very cerebral, but they know that they are entertainers. In fact, they are all world class entertainers without being overly flashy about it. And the one, the first time I saw him, the thing that blew me away was Howard started playing a solo, and and the and it's important to sort of picture how they appear on stage. So from the house, uh, Howard is is always stage left, then uh, Victor, then Bela, and then. Uh, or house left, I should say. Howard, then Victor, then Bela, and then house right is is Future Man. And so Howard starts taking a solo, and the three of them turn their bodies and just like stand in a staggered way, so they can all just watch Howard play the solo. And it's like, yeah, that's really smart because you've got all this music happening, and it's very you know, there's a lot of notes and all of that. It makes perfect sense to teach the audience who to look at at any point in time. And of course you can figure it out if you're, if you're listening, but they, you know, not everyone that comes to see them is a musician that has been on stage and understands all of this, right? Like they, they just, and it, you know, it's, it's that, it's that bluegrass mentality, although it's not really, I mean, very little of what they do is bluegrass, but they, you know, they really kind of focus on the soloist. And so whoever is playing a solo, every, everyone else in the band turns and looks at that person for the entirety of their solo. And it really makes for an interesting dynamic. It makes it engaging. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the soloist will step out, you know, in, in front of the monitors or whatever and, and play a little bit. But they're not, you know, they're not um, they're not acting like rock stars up there or anything. It's just they're just playing their instruments and, and killing it. But performing. they are performing 100 percent of the time. That's right. And they know that that's what's happening. And so instead of being the you know, if 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 let's say Howard's taking a solo, you know, Bela could just be staring at the ground. Right. Because in theory, the focus isn't on him. So he could he could take a breath. Right. Even though he's playing rhythm or comps or whatever underneath whatever the solo is, he could. But he doesn't because he knows that's not interesting to watch, you know? And so they all clearly intentionally decided to do this or it happened once. And then they said, let's keep doing that, you know? Uh, But that, that idea of just being aware a hundred percent of the time that you are being watched a hundred percent of the time, it's like you say all the time, it's a visual art and it really makes it entertaining. It, if you've ever seen the blue men group, um, Blue Man Group. I don't know why I said Blue Man Group. Uh, it's that it, like they they have a similar vibe w- during those moments where they just, like their eyes tell a lot of the story. Um, and I, I've always found that true of the, the Blue Man Group, too. But, you know, in those moments where they just kind of look at the guy that's that you're that you're supposed to be looking at. It's like, oh, that, that that thank you for telling me without having to tell me, you know, that sort of thing. Really, really smart stuff. And then and then, of course, they're just they're just like genuine. They come across. I don't know any of them personally, but they come across like genuine, uh, you know, they're, they're people. They're they're up there enjoying what they're doing and doing it because they enjoy it. And um, and they did. And they did. They did some Christmas tunes last night, too, which was great. They did. Um, You know, they're 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 a cerebral band. Right. So they did. Uh, they did sleigh ride in the, in the most traditional bluegrass style I heard all night, um, even though it was sort of weird. But then they did the 12 days of Christmas and they explained to us how they were going to do the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, they said, you know, just to make it interesting, uh, we're going to do each of the days in a different key. So we're just going to move chromatically around the, the, the scale. We're going to do each day in a different key. And, and they let the audience pick the the first key that they started with. And then also in a different time signature. So for, say, the first day of Christmas, it, it was in one every time. But the fifth day of Christmas was in five and the 11th day of Christmas was in 11, et cetera, et cetera. So kept it really interesting, you know, and, and they were, you know, they they worked. So it was interesting after our conversation last week of, do you ever bother to learn Christmas songs? It was like these guys have, you know, four shows to do or something where they could bother to to play this. And and yet they they take it to that level. So yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. Sorry, you were. I I, I was blazing. Well, I was there. just saying that that especially with complex music, that if you want to make it more palatable to an audience, what you do on stage can make a big difference. I'm thinking about you know Nick yeah. is putting together a Zappa tribute, and I sat in and listened to their first full band rehearsal, and it really went well. Um, you know, he's got 12 musicians. He's got a vibes player. He's got a guitar player, bass, drums, keys. And I think a six piece horn section right now and three singers right now, two women and one man. Wow. One man. Wow. And, um, but I, you know, I don't know that music, right? Sure. And, and I would, would think about, you know, there are people who are Zappa fans that, you know, you know what you're listening to, but if you wanted this to appeal to a broader audience and bring more people in, not so much appeal to a broader audience, but make it more of an inviting thing for more people to enjoy it. That type of thing to let people in on the yes. inside jokes or, you know, w- you know, of all this complexity coming off the stage, where should I be looking now? When we play classic rock, you, we all kind of know, right? We, these songs are on the radio all the time. We know this type of stuff, but you know, but you can still you do play, this stuff with classic rock and make absolutely. it, make the performance better. But, Yes. I, yeah, my point is more that you you get a little bit of a you get a little bit of wind at your back when you're playing classic rock. And that, you know, people yeah. know what's going on. But certainly, you know, like in jazz, I know I enjoy when I, I'm not a huge jazz fan, but like when my friends play jazz, if I go see them, the degree to which they're focusing on someone's solo and getting off on it, you know, makes it much more enjoyable to me. Yes. It makes the music come alive. You know, it, you know, I can now feel because I know where to look, you know, I, I know, you know, of course you can hear it, but you know, just kind of what's where the focus of the, of the musical piece is. Uh, if, if I know that the whole band is focused on it as well, it makes it more interesting to me. So I yep. think that that's, yeah. With regard well, to Christmas music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They sort of took it to a whole other level with that. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. I yeah. played, um, I mean, they I did a Christmas it. album, Several years ago, so I I don't uh, was that on it. I, you know, I'll, have to, I'll I'll look while we uh, chat here. I don't remember that, but I, it, this is not the first tour that, that they've done it. In fact, the first time I saw them, I seem to remember them playing some Christmas music because it was this time of year. And actually, I remember Victor Wooten also playing the the Linus and Lucy the the Peanuts theme uh, on the bass bass line and melody at the same time because that's you know how it goes. Um, but yeah. <laughs> So I have a couple of Christmas music anecdotes from my past weekend. So Friday right, night yeah. we did we did our coffee shop um, band uh, sing along gig, and we prepared I think about fourteen or fifteen songs. And then on Saturday I was actually uh, another band leader in town asked me to to join his little combo to be on a float and play Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer over nice. and over and over and over and over and over and over again as the float went down the parade route. Um, but uh, the thing, things about Christmas songs that were interesting, uh, they're really short often. Um, so you need a lot of them f- for a show. Um, I tried to choose songs that were close enough that people could sing along and enjoy. Mm, but, right. but, you know, I had a band and everybody had to find a part for some of these things. And so I went out looking for uh, uh, Christmas arrangements that, that this little combo that I have could reproduce. So we went to Willie Nelson's Christmas album and, and took a couple. I, I think we had a Jack Johnson song. You know, obviously the Bruce Santa Claus is coming to town. Um, Melon Camp's uh, I Saw Mama Kissing Santa Claus so we tried to make it an entertaining thing that, you know, you, even if you didn't want to sing every song, it would all be entertaining. And it was really, really fun. And people really, really got into it. And actually, surprisingly, the band actually got into it. So that's the key. I, right. Well, yeah. you know, this is the thing. This is the brown eyed girl, sweet home Alabama argument. Right. This is, you know, it is don't don't sell short the value of the joy you bring somebody by doing something familiar. Yeah. Or at least, yeah, something familiar. You're right. Yeah. Because like these Flectones tunes, when they played the Christmas songs, I, they were not th- like the version of Sleigh Ride doesn't sound like the version of Sleigh Ride you've ever heard unless you listen to their Christmas album. And the same is true of they did Silent Night and they did um, this 12 Days of Christmas thing, which was on their Christmas album. So so there you go. But um, but yeah, it, you know, they, like there's elements of it where you're like, I know that melody. But even but the but to your earlier point, the Flectones, my my son came with us for the first time. He's 18 and he was into it. Like, I mean, even before we went, 
he was listening to some of the music and he's like, oh yeah, I, 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 I might like this. I'm like, yeah, I think you will. And he said, I hope they play, you know, what, what he considered their hits, you know, and that, that could be a, there's a sort of wide range. And I, I didn't say anything to him because I knew he would enjoy it. But what I would have said and what we talked about afterwards is, you know, it doesn't really matter what song they're playing because they're entertaining at what they do and the way they take their solos and everything is engaging and you don't even care what song you're in the middle of with the way they, they, the way they perform. And he, he found, you know, he said that as, as we were leaving, he's like, yeah, it really didn't matter. I'm like, yeah, I know <laughs> these guys are really good at what they do <laughs> and, and they can get my son's a musician, but the, you know, they, they definitely can engage non musicians and non music geeks into it because of exactly what you said. They let you in on the joke uh, and, and what's going on, which is, which is the key, I think to, to one of the keys. It's not the only way to entertain a crowd, but it is a way to entertain a crowd. Uh, so yeah, it's crazy. That's crazy. Fun stuff. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, you see a lot of live music. You, you see more than I think anybody I know. How many, how many pro shows do you think you go to in a year? Oh man. So we would count. Couple last, a month? Yeah. It's usually a couple of month is, is probably what it balances out as. Yeah. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. You know, it's, I learn Obviously. a lot. I, um, it's inspiring. You know, it keeps me engaged. It gives me different ideas. And it's just, and it's also on top of all that, it's entertaining. I, I just love seeing people play music. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's good. What's um, the closest venue to you that has, um, that has kind of, you know, name and name touring entertainment. Is it the, the, the club of the beach? Um, yeah, that would be one of them at the, the Hampton beach ballroom casino and ballroom, they call it. That, that would be sure that would be one. I mean, there's there's, you know, the music hall in Portsmouth, which will occasionally. Well, no, the music hall in Portsmouth definitely draws, you know, name brand acts, if you will. But, um, you know, and that's that's maybe 20 minutes away. And the, the one down in Hampton for me is 25 minutes away or something. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Occasionally, the Stone Church will bring people in. That hasn't so much been the case with the most recent owners because they're focused a little differently. But that's five minutes from my house. And that that place has a long history of bringing in, you know, top rated acts and stuff. But it's small. So it's it's hard for a band to make, you know, enough money to be on the money. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe. I, I th honestly, I think fire code, there is 99 people at the stone church, but I've certainly been in that room with 200 people and it's fine. You know, as long as everybody's mm. focused in the right way. <laughs> uh, yeah, it can be good. It can be good. But yeah, we've, we've got enough venues around us. Um, I always would like more, but you know, last night we were in Portland, Maine and there's, there's a couple really good venues up there in Portland, Maine now. And that's, it's an hour from here, but it is an easy hour. You just get on the highway and then suddenly you're there and you just get off and park and walk to the venue. So it's pretty good. It's not too bad. So I've been thinking a lot, you know, with, um, I've mentioned with fling, but we are in a, a weird, uh, well, I don't want to say weird. We are in a transition type period here, right? Where when I started with fling, they were not a gigging band. They were working on originals and playing some, you know, maybe shoegazing style covers that they all sort of liked. And, and that was fine. Like when I joined them, my point was not to, I was already in a gigging band and I just wanted to meet some local people. Cause I had, you know, I had just moved here about a year prior or whatever. And through time, you know, the guys in fling the the lineup sort of solidified. It was, it was somewhat loose and for a little bit, but the lineup solidified to the five of us that it is now. And we collectively wanted to, you know, start playing more out like playing gigs we would get asked to play like you know backyard barbecues and things like that and then it was like oh let's be a little more intentional about this so we were and through that naturally came the uh the pattern i don't even want to say it was a decision uh, although it certainly was a, a, a tacit decision <laughs> but it, it the decision to play co covers as a you know, significant part of our repertoire, right? The originals never really stopped, but,
but covers became a thing because it was easy to to just go and play gigs with with covers. So it was fine. And we did that for a long time. I mean, I've been in fling for 12 years now, I think. So 13 years, maybe more. And so we did that for a while and and we were all like into it and every like every gig we went out to play, we went out to prove something, right? We were everybody was there at rehearsals, we were focused on okay, you know, this is what this band is doing now. We're we're playing live, so let's think about what kind of songs we could play to play live and and let's let's, you know, engineer some endings of songs that will be impressive live. There was it was always that that shared focus and drive to make the live show as great as it could be. And, you know, there's some natural ebbs and flows that sort of happen with a band. And then it sort of backed off a little bit of that. Some of it had to do with, uh, you know, I've mentioned our keyboard player has had some uh, moves and life changes and things that makes him less available. And so that, I think that sort of maybe accelerated the natural ebb and flow of things where the ebb. Yeah. The ebb. There you go. Yeah, exactly. And, and now we are. And and so we've kind of, I feel like we've bounced off the ebb now. Uh, we've, we've been talking a lot about what the future of fling looks like very intentionally. It had always been sort of back channel uh, in different ways that everybody was talking about it. And it was a little, it got to be a little bit insidious, not intentionally, but you know, those things, when you have more than three people in your band, it can become bad news when there's, you know, sidebar conversations happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and so there was some of that bad news stuff going on, like a little bit, nothing again, like the love that the five of us have for each other. It was always there, but it was always like, what direction are we going in? And, And so there were some different opinions about that, 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 Nobody pushed anything overly because of the respect that we have for each other. But it was obvious that it was like, well, we aren't all really into what we're doing like we used to be. And that was partially because what we were doing had sort of changed without us intentionally changing it, you know, a little bit enough that it sort of it it broke the momentum and, and caused that ebb. Right. And so we've been talking a lot about it. And. We're really starting to focus more on originals now. We've got a couple of gigs coming up where it makes perfect sense for us to play all originals. And I'm actually really excited. I couldn't possibly be more excited about it. It's it's great. I'm I believe that my bandmates all share that same excitement, but I don't want to put words in anyone else's mouth. And mm. and, we, and it's too soon for me to say, ah, I have some history. I can point to a thing where that says we're all truly on the same page, but it, it feels like we are. And, and it's, it's when we've got some excitement and some momentum internally, and there's more songs being generated and, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking along those lines, which is collectively thinking along those lines, which is great. So, but this is it, you know, I, it got me to thinking, right. Cause it's this ebb and flow. Is, if you're in a band long enough with all of the same people, or perhaps even with different people, it, this is going to naturally happen. It happened with, you know, when I was in go figure, uh, the original band that I was in in college that did fairly well. Uh, and we had to, you know, uh, we had a weird ebb and flow cause our, our lead singer started as the one that was sort of driving the bus there and booking all the gigs and making everything happen. And he just started to burn out and I don't even think he realized it. Uh, but then I, you know, I realized that something needed to be done. So I just started booking all the gigs cause I, somebody needed to, you know, we didn't want to, to fall off the, the, the train tracks there mm-hmm. and, and it worked out okay. And then he came back around and, but it was like, it was one of those things where the band, the band of course eventually did Peter out because we had some people leave and new people came in and it just, you know, it changed it enough. That's always a dangerous thing. When someone new comes in, it, it, it causes the light to be shined on any even somewhat minor, you know, differences or discrepancies that, that might have been overlooked if if things were just, you know, hurtling forward at a fast speed that, you know, if you shine the light too soon or at the wrong time can, you know, it can be the end of it. And it, it was sure. with that band. So. Uh, but, you know, we were also whatever, 17 or 20 or something and and had a lot less wisdom than, than, uh, than, <laughs> than, than I have now. So, you know, it's all fine, but, um, but yeah, I just, I, I don't know, like that, that, that whole ebb and flow thing, it's a, it's a, it's a frustrating thing, but it's a normal thing. 
And I just kind of wanted to, you know, yeah, say it out I, loud because I know I know we're not the only band that goes through this kind of stuff. It, it could. Well, I've certainly be. seen it. Yeah, yeah. You know, this year it, there was less holiday work. So I had planned our schedule, assuming we we're going to get more holiday work, more corporate stuff. And I spent a fair amount of time trying to beat the bushes and bring some of that as in. And it didn't come in as much as I would have liked. And we're slower really for the first time that I can remember. And, you know, it, there are a lot of variables that get thrown at any band at any one time. Every, you know, every band member's life situation, the status of their relationship, the status of their yeah. job, the status of where they're going to live. I mean, those things are always potentially can change. And if we go back to one of the great pearls of wisdom that I think you and I have encountered is that successful bands in general have got the band members are all have a tacit agreement of the goals of the band, how much you want to play, how much you want to rehearse, yep. what type of music, you know, you're, you're on the same page about the big things. <clears throat> and, um, or at least you when, think you are, <clears throat> well, you've, you've done, you've made, you've made the effort to, you know, before you bring someone into a band, yes. Ask those types of questions. You state clearly what the roles are going to be. I mean, you've made a, you've made the, the effort, to try and create that environment where everybody can be clear on where we are and where we're going. The problem, the problem with that is it like you, you can, but people grow and people change. Right. That's what I'm saying. They're variables, right? It's not a constant just because we all agreed that, you know, five years or even five months ago doesn't mean that it is a permanent truth, right? (laughs) It's that's right. Things evolve. Yeah. It's, which is like you said, exactly normal. But when those, those multifaceted variables come into conflict with each other. You know, things happen. I know for me, the one of the core things that I tried to do was keep my band working, hmm. figuring it, that that will keep people's attention. That will keep people from, from, and I said this from the beginning, we're going to be a working band. So if you want to be in this band, if I want you and you want me, you know, expect that I'm assuming that you're available to play and you know, you want to play as much as possible. Yeah, and that was a core premise. And that has worked for a real long time. And the guys I have are all on. We were on somewhat of a mission when we started. Um, you know, we were certainly the only band around with a five piece horn section. Um, I think I've shared, you know, my early assumptions was to try and do, you know, n- not the usual cover stuff and try and dazzle everybody with how how wonderful the music I loved the most. How was, great your fastball was. Great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You haven't seen my fastball. And, you know, slowly I got kind of, you know, shown that if you want to work, you got to make people happy and you got to give people something that mostly what they know. And so, you know, we made some decisions and a move, but we've been as a band on a mission to achieve uh, better gigs, better paying gigs, better audience, you know, for gigs, um, being able to not have to take certain types of gigs just because it's a gig. And we, we've kind of moved up, but this is a 20 year story now and we have a lull uh, and my life situation is going to change. And I've done my best to communicate to my guys. Here's what you can expect from me, sure. at least for the next year. Right. And right. give right. them a pretty honest plan. I don't doubt that the guys are like, well, I appreciate you're saying that. And I believe you think you mean that, but right. I'll believe it when I see it, which is only natural. That's, that's totally, totally well, it's, it's fair, right? Cause, because yep. th- that's what history, uh, not history with you, but history in general tells us all is yeah, okay. Like, yeah, Paul's a stand up guy. He absolutely means this, <laughs> but you know, just like we said, it doesn't matter what you said five months ago or five years ago. It's like things change. And yeah, 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 yeah. It could, it could go, it could go, Exactly as you predict, it could go better for the band than you could predict, or it could go worse, right? There's, it's just how it's going to be. You got to get get and do it. I mean, you have yeah. the best intention to follow through with the plan. Exactly. But we're in an we're in an, an ebb right now, hmm. and I'm just kind of, you know, my natural tendencies are to worry, and so I'm, you know, I'm like on Slack, hey, how's everybody doing? You know, making sure the guys are engaged just trying to keep my ear to the ground. Are guys getting involved with other things that therefore may take their time and create a booking, you know, problem for me. Sure. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I, and I've shared this kind of insecurity in a few ways with you to be totally candid. And again, it's, I don't ever tell someone you can't do something. The general rule in our band is assume I'm going to book, book, keep your weekends open, you know, and then within a 30 day window, you can take a sub gig. But now guys are starting to say, well, Paul's going to go, 
He's going to move farther away. We're going to play less. I don't want to, you know, have dead weekends. So it just makes sense to me. They're, you know, thinking about things like, you know, solo gigs or other projects and that type of stuff. Sure. So we're, we're not only ebbing, we're, um, you're morphing. Well, well, morphing. That's it. I was going to say fraying, but really it is morphing. Yeah. And I, I am interested to see how this happens. I mean, I'm right now I'm doing a pretty good job delivering by booking gigs and, you know, showing guys that it's going to be a pretty busy, and you know, at least our busy season, you know, we've got our normal two or three club gigs in the winter, you know, per month uh, and always looking for more. And then the summer is starting to fill in, you know, as it usually does morphing. Yeah. I didn't even think about that word, but that's it. We are becoming this thing where can that morph be a, everybody be happy with it. Right. Well, and it might work out that like people doing other side projects, a lets them scratch an itch that then that then allows them when they're with the house rockers to be focused on the things the house rockers are good at, as opposed to this is the only project that I have time for, but I really want to try some weird thing. So I, I'm going to try and shoehorn it into the house rockers, right? Like that there's, there's that, I don't know how much you're, I'm, I'm just using it as mm-hmm. a, a general example, but there is that kind of stuff. But then also as people are off doing side projects, a, they, uh, you know, they're going to learn and improve at their instruments. Presumably they're going to learn some new things. And some of that stuff might come back in a very productive way to the house rockers that the, of course, all of this could go totally sideways. Somebody's side project could get popular and, and, you know, pulls them away from the band and all that stuff too. But, you know, but there are, I, I have seen side projects in that sense or multiple projects. I don't even want to call it side projects, but you know, multiple projects sort of work very well to, to, to make a, any given musician more valuable to all of them. If that person can manage a schedule in a way that's compatible with, with everything else. And and that's so really I'm the trick. Fighting my internal tendencies to be skeptical and, and, you know, be, sure. you know, and, and actually I am, I'm all in, I'm pushing my chips in that the natural holistic morphing that's happening will turn the light bulb on. Like we have a really good thing here. Yeah. It's going to change a little bit, but let's, let's, you know, know that we still have a really good thing here that can be really good and really rewarding. Well, and sometimes a, a side project can make that very apparent, right? Like when you're like, Oh dude, I've been doing this. This is easy. Like we can just go play great gigs. And then, you know, you get four or five gigs into this side project. You're like, Whoa, I forgot what it was like <laughs> to start over like that's the work. This is heavy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got to promote this thing. I don't get to just go show up and play for hundreds of people. Huh? You know, like <laughs> they can be one of those things where you come back. You're like, oh, yeah, well, yeah I'll yeah. ask you. Have you have you seen a band go all the way around the cycle? Ebb, flow, ebb, you know, really come full circle where you have these times where exterior forces impose an ebb. Yep. And everybody finds their way home. Yeah, I, I have, um, you know, the, the band I was in in college did that a couple of times, like I said, and and it it worked out until it didn't, you know, but but we definitely saw some success. And I mean, we you know, we played for pretty big crowds. We sold some records. It was, you know, it was good mm. uh, fling. It, we've I've definitely seen, you know, come around in different ways. It's interesting because flings momentum is to be a hold up studio band like that. That really is where like fling focuses uh, just naturally. It, it's just how, how that band kind of goes. But we also, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll see some of the guys be like, Oh yeah. You know, it's, I don't care about playing live or whatever. And it's like, yeah, okay, cool. And then sure enough, you know, it comes back around. It's like, Oh, I missed that. Like, yeah, right. Like it, we can have it all. And and we can, you know, so I have, I've seen it, I've seen it go around and I've seen it die. You know, I have had the pleasure of joining a lot of established bands and uh, that can, that can work out really well and it can work out terribly. You know, like I said, bringing someone new in 
causes can cause everything to be reevaluated, you know, and and again, that can be a really good thing. And I've seen bands, you know, sort of level up from that. And I've seen bands totally peter out when, I, you know, well, either. Yeah, let remembering. me twist this a little bit. Yeah. So I said I, I played on a on a Christmas parade float this weekend yeah. and, and the band leader who asked me to come join him. He was organizing this is great guy. Kelly Aronica has a really legendary local band called the Hitmen. They're super, okay. you know, funk, you know, just great musicians. Sure. Really fun band. Anyway, Kelly was telling stories about um, he was a touring musician doing the cover band circuit in the 70s and early late 70s, early 80s. And I when guess you could you tour know, as a cover band, which is a well, whole the thing. different thing. That's right. He went to Alaska. He did basically the Western U.S., New Mexico, yeah. Colorado, Wisconsin, he, you know, uh, Wyoming. He basically played, you know, holiday in ballrooms, clubs, whatever it is. There was a touring circuit that some um, agent, booking agent, you know, controlled that and was his job was to get a. A, a, a fresh blood of of touring cover bands going through, and actually Russ uh, in my band yeah. did a little of that as well. Actually, did more than a little of that. And the stories are really fascinating to me. And Kelly said, you know, if you imagine that he ended by the mid eighties, I think he said the most he ever made was like almost four hundred dollars a week. That was that was touring musician money yep. of this type of circuit back then. Anyway, Kelly talked about that was his life. You know, he was, that's what he did. And he would talk about putting bands together and um, so different than me in that I, when I put a band together, I was like, can I, can I live with this guy? Can I play with this guy? Can I be friends with this guy? Because having that sense of camaraderie is, is a. That's important to you. Yeah, that's me. Right. Yeah. But I get the sense, you know, the, the, the other way to look at it is that it's, you know, it's a financial transaction. It's a business transaction. And yeah, I want a guy that if I'm going to have to be on the road with, you know, that I'm not going to hate. But, you know, will he show up? Will he be loyal? Will he be a good employee um, is a different filter than will he be a good friend and a good band? Yeah, you right? almost when you're on the road like that's a that's. It's not just spending five hours with somebody in a club where most of the time is spent either, you know, setting up, tearing down or playing. Being on the road, you have your downtime together and you don't necessarily want somebody that's going to be high maintenance in terms of, uh, you know, needing your attention. You, you want it. So you don't like finding someone that appears to be very friendly might be a bad thing. You want a guy who can take care of himself. Yes. Like, you want to independent be a good employee. people. Yeah. Like if I leave you alone, if if we're both alone in a room or both, we are alone together. I don't know, whatever it is. But, <laughs> yeah, but that's sort of the trick is you need to be able to be alone together. Like if there's two books on the table and the two of us are in a room uh, and I pick up a book, are you going to pick up the other book and read it? Or are you going to try and talk to me about the book that I'm reading? Because if it's the latter, that's probably not going to work out on the road. You know? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's times when you want to have those conversations, but you need to be able to be alone, trapped together on a bus. Yeah. Because my point we all need our It's it's all the business model that you have of your band. So to me, I wanted to put together a tight group that came off as a tight group on stage and, you know, had that um, inclusive vibe that, yep. that to me is 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 what you do i mean i i, I wouldn't know how to do it any other way is that but that's my but that's you sure right and but i do get that there's like listen here's the book and you know you will play it down and if you can't play it down i can get someone else who can play it down and you know that's the extent you know uh, of the of the business model is like you know I, I want a guy who can just play what i need him to play yeah that's it. And that, yeah. what that does is that to some degree, if you if you work and the basic premise is show up to work and you'll get paid, um, you know, then then the premise is, you know, that you're good to go. You're, you're good to yeah, go. you got to be able to play. You got to have the right look like, I mean, yeah. those two things are important when you're just hiring to for a road dog like that. Right. You got to you know, what's what are you going to look like on stage and can you play? That's but that, well, my point is that this erases kind of the ebbs and flows so long as the business is going that those exterior social factors um, that you would naturally want to help a friend with, you know, that you would get involved with their life. Sure. And that would complicate the, uh, the, you know, the social management of the band. Right. That's true. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like if somebody, if it's just like, this is the, this is the expectation of this job. Yeah. Yep. And if you have a change in your life, that means you can't do that, then just tell me and I'll find somebody else to do that. That's right. 
Yep. Yeah. But, you know, in my band, if a guy's going through a social, you know, a girlfriend problem or a wife problem, you know, you, you give them a breathe. They don't get fired for something like that. Sure. Um, but, you know, in a purely financial arrangement, they might. Right. Right. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Ebbs and flows. I mean, it, it, it's a it's an interesting thing. And I think this is the question of loyalty, you know, and commitment and are people who you think that they are. I choose to think that all the guys that I've had with me, they have, most of them have been with me for such a long time. We, we are, are largely on the same page. Of course, there's a little things to medium sized things that come up that, that, that test it. Of course. But I think, and you know, and I'm right now choosing to let everybody figure out what this means. I do think I do. I want to have a band conversation and just kind of get anything that we have to get out on the table, on the table and just, you know, see where we are coming out of this ebb, you know, been a slow November, slow December starts to pick up again next month. And, and we're going to, we haven't been rehearsing. So, you know, to give people time off for the holidays, but it, we'll I will get say, back to I will, our, our business in January. I will tell you in fling to have that conversation took a lot more work than I would have expected. Like if this was, if this was at my business, it would have been like, all right, on Tuesday at 4 PM, we're going to sit down and have this conversation about this issue, whatever the issue is, you know, direction, whatever it is, right. The steering committee is going to get together and decide where to steer the ship, you know, or whatever mm -hmm. in a, in a band, not every, everyone needs to be on the same page or I want everyone to be on the same page. Uh, but not everyone is hired for their leadership ability mm. or their conversation ability or their comfort with what could be a confrontational style, you know, conversation. Like it's, it might be that one person sits down and says, I would like to do this. And another person feels, well, I, I want to I, I want to tweak that a little bit. And if if everyone is not comfortable having the same volume of their voice in that conversation that can be disastrous, right? Because you leave thinking that everyone's on the same page, but maybe they are not. And, and so for this round of this with fling, it started with a lot of patience. Um, and, and it was email conversation. Fling has always been very, very comfortable with, with email amongst us. I mean, if there's some like problem, we, we, we you know, we're, we don't like, you know, we don't get into flame for, flame wars or whatever via, via email, but we're comfortable with long emails is what is what I should mm -hmm. say. So if somebody needs to share a thought, everyone is fine reading and writing long emails, but not necessarily with the frequency. Uh, the frequency is not shared amongst everyone. And so, there are folks in the band that are, you know, just naturally quieter than than others. I think you could probably guess where I fall in that spectrum. Uh, but I mean, I come here and talk for at least an hour every week. So uh, but it was it required. So therefore, on my part, it required a lot of patience. It was like, OK, I'm going to put a question out there and then I have to shut up for maybe two weeks until mm -hmm. everybody else has time to process and shares their thoughts because if I start sharing mine, I, I, I could very easily there's there's a few of us that could very easily just dominate the conversation. And then there's just no room for anyone else. And so I got to ask the question about that, that. Yeah. What do you do if somebody doesn't respond? Do you pull them in and say, do you have something to add or? or yeah, because to me, that's that's almost more indicative that everybody is in there rolling up their sleeves, working together on a, on whatever it is that you're discussing. That's the thing. Yep. To me, I see more of the manifestation that um, the quiet guys in the band who tend not to, even though it might be even a safer thing to do it, you know, behind the keyboard than it is in a, in a face to face situation. Sure. You, you don't get full, at least in my band. I don't think we get full, full equitable, you know, contributions. And so the guys who write the longest are the loudest. Be, yeah. Are the loudest. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, and we were all very aware of that. In fact, I sort of said it when I, when I began this, this most recent round of, of this conversation it was like, okay, look, we, we all need to have an equal voice here. And so that means that, you know, we'll just wait and, and everybody chimes in once. And if that means we wait a week to hear from until everyone has had a chance to do that, that's okay. You know, it doesn't all need to be in the next 40 minutes here. 
kind of thing. Even though as an impatient cat, that yeah. is my preference. But not everybody, you know, not everybody's life is such that they can be, you know, immediately responsive to an email. And not everybody uh, is as comfortable with their own. I don't even want to say comfortable. That, that makes it sound the wrong way. Uh, not everyone thinks as as quickly in these types of scenarios. So someone might need a few days to to truly let their thoughts percolate in a way that they have something meaningful to share that is actually reflective of the way they think. Right. And, and that's fine. And, and I, I, we knew that kind of going into this and everybody was very respectful of that and it worked out fine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it, you know, it's certainly better than I've ever seen it work out before, but it, it took, I, I, and I'm probably speaking for some of the other impatient people in fling, but I can speak for this particular impatient person uh, that it took a lot of, you know, self-restraint to not chime in, you know, uh, and and move the conversation forward because it wasn't moving as quickly as I wanted. And I, I just I thought, oh, what's the benefit of of pushing this along? And it's like, well, there's a, there's a lot of detriment. There's no benefit to pushing it along unless what I want is to push whatever I think my agenda for, you know, reflective of the band is. And that's not what I'm looking for. I'm actually looking for what everybody has to say. And it's a little time and everybody chimed in and we had our conversations and it's been extremely productive and it's actually been great. It's kind of gotten everybody on the same page, which is cool. So, but it, but it's, it's frustrating for impatient people like you, you and me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard. And, and it's, it's these, you know, the, the, fra the fabric of a band is a fragile thing. Yep. You know, it, it can be tight, 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 but everything changes all the time. Everything all the time. Yeah. is in flux. And, you know, especially keeping a semi-professional weekend warrior band. Again, yep. when it's your job, that creates a whole different set of dynamics. Totally different. You know, we, had, yep. we, had, we had Kenny Aronoff on there and, you know, he was able to talk to us about what it means to be, take a job and what would happen if one boss wanted one thing, one, you know, the decisions he had to make, that's one type of thing. But for those of us who do it out of passion and love, you know, or as a part-time job or, 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 you know, even if it's a localized, you know, if you're a local working cover band, yeah. you know, it, it, but the dynamics are so different and keeping something of quality. I'm thinking back to where we started the show, you know, the two experiences you had out in Martha's Vineyard, you know, one band that had their act together, one band that didn't have their act together. Is that a result of back end social fabric, not being <laughs> managed to great expectations? It could be. Oh, I, absolutely. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I can't speak for these people. I've, I've already peered into their lives far deeper than than I, I actually could. You know, I've, I've Tim project, Jones is not happy with you. Tim Jones hates me right now. And <laughs> and probably for good reason, you know, because I, I made a lot of projections here that probably aren't true. Um, who knows? Maybe maybe his drummer like, you know, broke his or her leg that morning and he had to pull in the sub or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, it could have been anything. But uh but yeah, yeah, it like that can definitely if you're not all on the same page about what you're doing when you walk on stage, regardless of whether you're on the same page about what you're going to be all be doing six months from now together, you know, but if you're not on the same page when you walk on stage, that will end it real fast. You know, Van Halen, I, I read that book by Noel Monk. Great book, by the way, even if you're not a Van Halen fan, but you know, he taught, he was their road manager for eight years and really helped bring them up and, and created the whole concert merchandise thing. And it's some fascinating stuff. But, um, you know, he talked about how they they got to a point where they hated each other, but you'd never know it on when stage. they walked on stage every night. Yeah. They 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 were they had a shared, you know, your your term mission really is the right thing if you're walking on stage and you do not have a shared mission with your bandmates something is wrong i and i really believe that's true you, regardless of what goes on in your life and how much time you each have for the band separate from all that if you're going to walk on stage together and spend whatever one to three hours out there that mission needs to be clear and shared amongst everybody before you step foot on that stage otherwise it's not going to work not going to work yeah and what is that mission? It's always be performing, man, because that's what we Brings say it all here. together, doesn't it? It certainly does. It certainly does. 
This might be our longest episode yet. I don't know, but it's close. Over an hour. Topic. Yeah, man. Go visit Van Zoogle. Use that promo code GIGGAB to get 15% off your first year. And by all means, always, always be performing. <laughs> <laughs>